I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, and we will look this morning at the details of this magnificent chapter. Are you following the news? Do you know what's going on? Do you open the blogs and listen to the radio and maybe you subscribe to a newspaper? It's a reading implement from a bygone era. It's all fake. It's all fake news. And I don't care what side of any given issue you may be contemplating, the story's inaccurate. It's inaccurate in how incomplete it is. Whether or not there may be little factoids that blind squirrels find in the forest from time to time. If you want to know what's really going on, you will not find it in the news. You will not find it on the blogs or on the radio. You will, however, find it in the chapter we're looking at this morning in Revelation chapter 4. If you want to know what's going on, you have to have the inside scoop, the behind-the-scenes reporting that comes from God's own word. And what is really going on, the real news is this. God is preparing to judge the world from heaven and then to return to the earth personally to reset the world order. That's the news. That's what's happening. Let's read Revelation chapter 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, To him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created." All of the universe is rushing toward the visible, audible, inescapable worship of the one true God. There are five songs in this throne room scene. Many of the lyrics of our hymns come from this scene. The lyrics of the songs we sang this morning came from these two chapters. The first song is sung by four magnificent beings in verse 8, followed by the growing chorus of 24 elders in verse 10. Harps join in in chapter 5, verse 8, and then myriads and myriads of angels. And then finally, every created thing joins the chorus. These are concentric circles of worship and a growing chorus of praise. The scene we see in Revelation 4 and 5 will have everyone's attention one day, and we will give it our attention this morning. Last week, we looked at this throne room scene from parallel vantage points of the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. This morning, we will unpack the details of John's vantage point. To do so this morning, we will fix our gaze on three elements of the throne room scene three elements of this throne room scene to fix our gaze upon. And the first comes from verse 1. It is the prophet's invitation. 
Notice what John reports. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. The after these things leads us to this third section of the book of Revelation. You remember Revelation 119 gives us the outline for the book. John was to write down, record what he saw in the vision of Christ in chapter one, and then the state of the churches in his day in chapters two and three, and then the future beginning here in chapter four, verse one. What follows is the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. If you're holding up Daniel and Revelation together, Uh, This is what Daniel describes as that 70th week. And John reports there was a door opened in heaven. Now this is reminiscent of several scenes. In Acts chapter 7 at the stoning of Stephen, Stephen says, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen got to have a window, a, a view into heaven itself. And Paul reports of his own life in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I was caught up to the third heaven. And the Bible uses the word heaven or heavens to describe three different spatial realities. The first heaven is simply the sky where the birds fly in the heavens. The second spatial reality is space where the stars of the heavens are. But this third heaven is the throne room of God. It is the special dwelling place of God. This is the heaven out of which the new Jerusalem will come down on a new heavens and new earth. This is where God dwells. This is where he manifests his glory. And while God himself is not bound by space, the created beings there are. You could put a zip code on this place. It is an actual location. If we pull back the curtain on what's really going on in our world, we we peek here into the war room. This is a, a window or a door into the very throne room of God. And John is summoned by a voice. This is the voice of Jesus, the the same voice he heard in chapter 1, verse 10. It sounds like a trumpet. It is loud, penetrating, distinct, and it is a summons for John the prophet to peer into heaven. Jesus says, come up here and I will show you. John was invited through the door to the throne room of God, to the center of divine sovereignty, to see the reality, to see how things really are. And no one since John has seen it who has remained on this earth. But John saw it and wrote it down for our benefit. We need this glimpse of reality. And Jesus says, I will show you what must take place after these things. You see, what unfolds in this scene, the future history of our planet, must take place. It is inevitable. Because it is ordained and orchestrated by Almighty God, the maker and sustainer of all things. It is necessary because God's world is in rebellion against him. The glories of heaven must soon fill the earth. For now the door is closed. For now heaven appears silent while the earth rages in rebellion. This does not mean that heaven doesn't care. The truth is, what will happen in heaven one day will dramatically impact this earth. Every eye will see it. Eventually, every knee will bow to the one true God, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. John went up there, ushered through a doorway to see what will be brewing in the throne room. One day soon, what will be in heaven will come down here. So Christian, look up, metaphorically. Our hope for this world is there, through that door that John entered. Our home is with him. Our vindication comes through that door. This morning we have the opportunity to take a view of the reality and by it to take courage. What did John see through the door? We come now to the center of attention. The center of attention in verses 2 through 7. John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne standing in heaven, and one sitting on 
the throne. John the apostle, John the prophet, John the seer, the revelator, was transported across time and space. He was moved into the future and he was moved into another location, into heaven, as were Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, to look forward to this moment, this moment which is the coronation of Messiah. It's the beginning of the preparation of the earth for Messiah's arrival. And what did John see? Verse 2. A throne standing in heaven, that is, set and established. The thrones are important in the book of Revelation. 37 times the word throne appears in Revelation. The word throne appears only 15 times outside of the book of Revelation in the New Testament. 13 times the word throne is here in this chapter. This is a critical feature of the scene. It is at the center. And John says there is one seated on the throne. That is one who is reigning. He's not resting. He is seated authoritatively, sovereignly over all things. This is a picture of God and his majesty and his sovereignty. The bottom line is that everything happens because God. Everything happens from this throne. And this has always been the case. We think about what we can see and hear and taste and feel and touch here on this earth. What can we sense? What can we perceive? That's the reality. Or so we think. But the reality has always been, behind the scenes, the meticulous sovereignty of God, orchestrating every event in all of history. And history has a trajectory. It's going somewhere. You see, the manifest glory of God will fill the earth God will install his Messiah. His kingdom will come to earth like a mountain in Daniel 2 to obliterate all sinful human governance, to establish peace and prosperity and true worship and the righteous reign of God on the earth. And God cannot lose. He has never been off track. He has never had to regroup or fall back or retreat or reconvene. He has never needed a half time to re-strategize, to account for the unexpected wiles of his enemies. He has only ever had one plan, and that plan has been and always will be flawlessly executed from this throne. There are no regional deities. In the ancient conception, the the thought was the Babylonians had their gods and the Egyptians had their gods. The Assyrians had their gods and all the ites had their gods. And the God of Israel was just a regional deity competing with those others. And whoever's army won meant that their God was stronger that week. That has never been the reality. That God is one among many in a pantheon of regional competition among deities. He is the only God, and he wins. There are no rival religions. There are no competing views in the end of all things. Of course, the deists are wrong, those who think that, yeah, sure, there's a higher power that got everything going, but then just let it spin like a clock. And the naturalists are mistaken gravely. Those with a bent to think that things just happen naturally. They can be investigated scientifically with no account given to God. The truth is God has been meticulously orchestrating every single event in all of history. Revelation 4 reveals that God is in charge and nothing can thwart his power. It will all end as he designed. In fact, in Revelation 4 and 5, God's sovereign majesty is poised for judgment. Look down at verse 3. And the one sitting on the throne was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And we see the word like six times in this chapter, the word as three times in this chapter, and the word appearance several times. What's going on here? These are similes, they are comparisons, because words fail to express the grandeur and the glory and the brilliant beauty that is on display here. John can only make comparisons to known things. 
And he describes what he sees by two gemstones and a rainbow. The first stone is a jasper. This is a clear, brilliant, crystalline stone, probably a diamond. A sardius is ruby red in appearance, uh, probably a carnelian or a ruby. And these are interesting gemstones to mention. If you go back to Exodus 28, you discover that the high priest wore a breastplate, uh, this uh, golden plate on the metal with 12 precious gemstones on it. The first and the last of the 12 are mentioned here in this appearance of the one seated on the throne, the jasper and the sardius. Each one of those stones on the breastplate of the high priest, worn before God and worn before the people, had the name of one of the tribes of Israel inscribed on them, one of the names of the sons of Jacob. The first, the ruby, uh, was for Reuben. And Reuben's name means behold a son. He was the firstborn. And the last stone on that breastplate was the jasper or the diamond. And that was for Benjamin. Benjamin's name means son of my right hand or son of my power. And so what is radiating out from the throne of God in this scene in Revelation chapter 4, in dazzling brilliant light, the emblems of a firstborn who is about to reign with power. It's interesting. Whether or not God intends a, a correlation between what he placed on the breastplate of the high priest and what we see here, it is an interesting choice of stones that are described. There is also this emerald rainbow. It could be the half circle, the shape of a bow around the throne. Perhaps it is a full circle. The, the grammar seems to indicate it is surrounding the throne. It could be a full circle halo. And you know, the rainbow only shows up four times in your Bible. It is significant. It, we see it first, of course, in Genesis 9, after the flood, and then the other three times we see it referred to in this scene, in Revelation 4, Revelation 10, and in Ezekiel's description of this scene. And the meaning of the rainbow comes from its first appearance. That is God's undeserved mercy after the storm of his judgment. And every time you see the prismatic effect of the light spectrum split into its various colors, what are you supposed to remember? Remember? that God judged the whole world by a flood, and he promised not to do it again as long as the world is here. He promised seasons and harvests, that is, predictability and provision. That is undeserved, common grace kindness to a world still enslaved in rebellion against its maker. And when you see the rainbow, you should think of God's anger against sin, and you should think of his loving kindness towards sinners who trust in him. You remember those who saw that first rainbow. They were eight out of the population of the world rescued in God's kindness and then given this covenant promise. The rainbow signifies that the storm is over, the sun is out, and God keeps his promises. Of course, that symbol has been pirated on the earth in the last few years by a satanic mockery of God to conscript it into the service of sin. But God will not be mocked. The rainbow is precious to him. His covenant-keeping mercy is part of his character, and it radiates out from his throne. His sovereign plan and his purpose is, as always, to judge rebellion and to mercifully rescue rebels who turn to him in faith. And God is proclaiming this message in his war room. Look at verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, golden crowns on their heads. Around the throne of God are 24 additional thrones, and on them are 24 elders. There has been much debate about the identity of these elders. Are they angelic beings or are they humans? And if humans, who are they? I look forward to finding out. The text gives us some clues, but not identifiers. I will tell you briefly why I believe they are humans, not angels, and why I believe they are church-age saints, not from Old Testament Israel nor tribulation martyrs. Here's a couple of clues. They are called elders. Angels are all the same age. They were all born the same day. 
Only humans are described with the term elders in the Bible. They sit on thrones. Church age believers are promised thrones on which to reign with Christ. They are given white garments. While it is true that angels at times in your Bible are seen in white garments, in the book of Revelation, only the redeemed humans are described that way. And the white garments on redeemed humans are emblems of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. They are given to them as a gift of God's grace. They are not earned, they are not merited. It is a a tangible, visible symbol that the redeemed have been clothed with someone else's righteousness. And we know how they got there. By faith in the gospel. The gospel of God's good news that though all of us as sinners deserve to be under God's wrath and his righteous judgments, those who believe in his son Jesus Christ get clothed in Jesus' perfect righteousness. And this comes by faith, not by merit, not by anything you could do. You cannot earn these things. You cannot deserve them. And listen, when we approach this scene of God on his throne in all of his dazzling glory, we recognize very quickly, we do not belong there. No sinner could approach this scene and not be destroyed. And yet these elders sit and reign clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, their sins expunged, their filth covered, removed, gone. This is good news. These also have crowns. This is the word Stephanos. It is not the diadem, the the royal kingly crown. It is the, the crown of victory given to athletes and soldiers. Those who had come through the war, the contest, or the race as victors. This is appropriate for redeemed humanity. Angels instead are described as ministering spirits. Uh, They're they're never seen with crowns like this. The, The angels are those who are designed by God to serve the elect redeemed humans. So I believe these 24 are humans. I believe these 24 elders are also church age saints, not Old Testament saints because those haven't been resurrected yet according to the timeline here. Daniel 12 indicates they will be resurrected, given glorified bodies later. Tribulation martyrs, which show up in Revelation chapter 7, haven't been killed yet by the time this happens in Revelation 4. So only church age saints will be resurrected, clothed, enthroned, and crowned at this point in history. Why are there 24? I don't know. I look forward to finding out. There are interesting patterns of 12s and 24s in your Bible. You can search those out. There may be some correlation to some of those. What's interesting is these 24 elders are individuals. There are times where an individual, one of these elders, speaks and acts, and there are times where they, as a collective, act. These are servants of God. They are unnamed. Their histories are unknown. And I can't wait to find out more about them. But notice here their position. They are around the throne of God. He is the center of their attention. God has surrounded himself with beings fit to render him the glory that he is due. And look down at verse 5. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Notice that this throne is not serene. It is turbulent. There is thunder that shakes and lightning that bursts forth and there are war torches. You see the word lamps in your English Bible. It makes it sound like a soft light, stationary reading lamp on an end table. That is not the picture here. This is a a flaming, fiery torch used in times of war. This scene is reminiscent of Exodus 19. I'll just read to you, beginning in verse 16, the, the appearance of God before the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. It came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. 
Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. This scene in Revelation 4 is reminiscent of these times where God came and dwelt violently in the midst of his people. In fact, in the book of Revelation in chapter 8 and 11 and 16, we, we'll, we'll see the throne ushering forth lightning and thunder, all preceding impending judgments. It's a message that the, the throne is perturbed, turbulent, a storm is coming. It is a storm of God's wrath against the earth dwellers. And the seven war torches are the manifold presence of the Holy Spirit of God. He will consume the rebels. According to Zechariah 4, God is prepared to act powerfully by His Holy Spirit to bring about His righteousness in the earth. This is a scene of war. And listen, it is right for the throne of God to be turbulent when His creatures rebel. This is not out of sorts for God. He's not out of control. In fact, what is so wrong is for us creatures to love lesser things than him, to not give him the glory that he is due, for us to be distracted, to reject, ignore, or despise him. Listen to Isaiah 24, describing the future day of Yahweh when heaven will burst forth on the earth. Isaiah writes, Behold, Yahweh lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for Yahweh has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, the exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants because they transgressed laws, violated statutes, and broke the everlasting covenant. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. It will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit. The one who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows above are opened and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder. The earth split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. It totters like a shack. For its transgression is heavy upon it. It will fall. So it will happen in that day that Yahweh will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. For Yahweh of armies will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. The turbulent throne that John sees with the thunder and lightning emanating forth and the Holy Spirit of God ready for war. These are the audiovisual preamble to coming judgment. Look at verse 6. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Before the throne, spread out like a pavement under it and all around it is something like, John says, a sea. Again, he's making comparisons to what he can visualize. These are real realities that he saw and he is forced to describe them with what he can. This is reminiscent of Exodus 24.10 and the view of heaven there that was given to Moses when he saw the God of Israel and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. You remember that the pattern in heaven, the original, became the template for the structures built on earth, the tabernacle and then Solomon's temple. The laver, the wash basin of the tabernacle, the tent in the wilderness, uh, was made from the women's hand mirrors. Why do you think Moses collected all the hand mirrors of the women to build this sea, this wash basin before the tent of God? Uh, perhaps to reflect the dazzling reflective brilliance of what he saw in heaven. And then you think about Solomon's temple, the bronze sea, that was the word given to that giant dish that was built on top of 12 oxen. 
The whole thing made out of bronze and, 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 and water filling it. Both of these shining basins were used to ceremonially wash the priests preparing for service in the tabernacle and the temple. They were copies of the things that were seen in heaven. Of course, the original is way better. To have a sea of glass is, is illustrative. Glass in the ancient world was semi-opaque. You, you, you couldn't see through it very clearly. But this glass, this sea, this glass-like sea is described as crystal clear, dazzling, brilliant, reflecting and refracting, I don't know what those words mean, reflecting and refracting light and colors in every direction like a brilliant gem. I loved looking at my wife's engagement diamond under the lights at Grace Community Church in Southern California. They had these really wonderful lights overhead on the ceiling, and uh, maybe we can replace our warehouse lighting someday. Um, but, but those lights in that darkened room lit up a diamond so that the fiery sparkle in the stone seemed to have a light source all its own. It's the kind of lighting that jewelers use when you buy gemstones from them. And maybe we could encourage more marriages if we change the lights in here a little bit. But it's just really fun to look at those gemstones under certain lighting. Can you imagine the scene there? Uh, the entire pavement before the throne of God, brilliant and dazzling. Listen, nobody's bored there. Nobody's distracted there. This is dazzling. It, it, the scene is humbling. It makes the participants feel small. It's captivating. There's this gravitational pull of the eyes and the affections toward the center and the one seated on the throne. It is simultaneously wonderful and terrifying, awe-inspiring, fear-provoking. And then there are these four living beings. The old King James called them beasts, that's an unfortunate translation. There's another word for beasts, and beasts are bad guys later in the book. Uh, these are creatures. Uh, sometimes we think of animals, but that's really not the right way to think of these. I, I want to call them the four living beings. They are created beings. They are said to be in the middle of the throne and surrounding the throne. They are in the inner circle of the worship of God. Four magnificent created beings who reflect the character of God and they station themselves in readiness to do his bidding and they worship him. These are the cherubim. We see the cherub in Genesis 3.24 in the Garden of Eden. God stationed one there with a flaming sword to keep Adam and Eve out of the garden, out of access to the tree of life, out of access to the direct presence of God after they sinned. They couldn't be in there anymore. In 1 Kings 6, it was the cherubim who were at the, the center of the center of the tabernacle and the temple complex. They were in the holy of holies. They are featured on the top of the ark, the golden tablet that uh, manifested the mercy seat and uh, demonstrated God's presence. These are the cherubim of Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, the fiery ones that we looked at last week. And look at verse 7. The first of these creatures was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had a face like a man, the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. These creatures have faces. While John the Apostle here focuses on one face for each, we learn in Ezekiel that each of the creatures has four faces. John draws our attention to one on each creature. One represents a lion. This is the chief of wild animals. The other an ox, the chief of domesticated animals. The other a man, the chief of all of God's created order. And then the eagle, the chief of the sky. Together, these creatures represent the created order before God, and they represent God from his throne before the created order. And they seem to be a vital part of the throne. In Ezekiel, they were wrapped up in the wheels, those, uh, those agents of movement where the, the throne moved from place to place. 
They depict mobility, strength, and awareness. They, they have eyes everywhere so that no matter where their wings are or what their wings are doing, their, their eyes can still perceive everything. They are never blinded to what's going on. Nothing escapes their perception. And there are four of them. This, this probably indicates the, the reality of their ever presence. There are four corners of the earth, four winds, four cardinal directions. These are ready with speed and power to implement the sovereign rule of God in all of creation. Now think about creation, not in heaven, but down here. You think about Romans 8 and and all of the created order right now is subjected to futility. It is frustrated. It is under the curse of God. It is bent out of shape in the words of Ecclesiastes. But in heaven, created things are in order. And they are preparing to reshape the universe in conformity with God's righteous reign. And notice what they do. The end of verse 8, day and night they ceaselessly worship. These beings worship. This brings us to the third point in our outline and the substance of the exaltation. What's on the minds and the hearts of the 24 elders and the four living creatures and as we expand the circle into chapter 5, what is on the lips of all who are present to this scene. This is the substance of the exaltation. Look where it begins. Holy, 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 verse 8, is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. This is the first of 14 songs in the book of Revelation. And it begins in this inner circle with the four living beings whose consuming occupation is to vocalize praise to the glorious one on the throne. And they give here the same song that we saw in Isaiah 6, the three times superlative holy. To say something twice in Hebrew was to really say it, to to say it's the, the best to to give the superlative. To say something three times was to go beyond that. And here, what do they say three times over? Holy, holy, holy. Now we think of holiness probably most often as the opposite of sinfulness. We, We think of it in terms of purity, moral purity. But holiness is bigger than that. It is broader than that. When these creatures who have never sinned who have never been filthy, who have never been in need of redemption, when they cry, holy, 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 they are not saying, oh God, you're sinless and we're sinful. They're not saying that at all. They, They don't know what sin is experientially. By saying, holy, 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 they're going back to the basic meaning of the word for holiness, that is, separation. They are crying out to God, you are different, different, different. You're not like us. You see, all of the created universe has something in common with every other element of the created universe, and that is its having been created. God alone, God alone is uncreated. There's no one like him. And so it is right for every created being to follow the lead of these four living beings in crying out, holy, holy, holy is God. This ought to keep us away from a gross familiarity with God as if we're the same. Fundamentally, we are not. There is an infinite chasm between the created and the creator. Now, God has bridged this chasm by His grace so that we have access to Him, but we will never be like Him in His fundamental nature. And these beings cry out ceaselessly the infinite difference between the uncreated Creator and everything else, even themselves. And notice what they do. They reflect back the truth of who God is. This is substantive worship. Right? This is not mere emotionalism. 
hey, let's get together, and if we're all doing the same things at the same time, it creates an energy, a vibe, an emotion, and it'll be really cool. And, and if you've been to an anthem band in a stadium that does a really good job of getting a whole crowd to sing the same notes with meaningless words over a chord progression, you know the feeling of being ginned up emotionally. It's entertaining, it's moving, it's worth paying money for. <laughs> That's not this. There is no doubt that there is a, a simultaneity of worship. They have joined their voices in unison. There's no doubt there is emotion here. They are affected, as will every created thing when we enter this scene. But their worship is substantive. It is not meaningless emotion. It is based on the truth of who God is. And notice what they point out. First of all, His holiness. Secondly, His power. The Lord God, the Almighty, the Pantocrator. This is the, the one who has power over all things. The all-powerful, the Almighty. This is a, a significant statement. Nobody can thwart God's purposes. There is none stronger than him. Every strength that exists derives from what he provides. He is the all-powerful. He is also the one who eternally exists. Notice, who was and who is. He presently exists and he always has been. There's nobody who has always existed but God. And there is a statement here about his judgment. He was and he is and he is to come. This is not merely a statement of the fact that God will exist forever. Uh, we'll get there in a moment. But this idea of the coming one here is a, a reference to his imminent cataclysmic judgment of the earth dwellers. This will show up again and again in the book of Revelation. And listen to Nahum 1.6. Who can stand before God's indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath will be poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. These living beings know God and they proclaim God in his manifold attributes. Look at verse nine. And the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and to him who lives forever and ever. They magnify his sovereignty, he sits on the throne, and his eternality, he lives forever and ever. Here they are speaking about the fact that God will never cease to exist. And it is true that us created beings, uh, angelic beings and human beings, have eternality. That is, we will exist forever. No human being will go out of existence those who believe in annihilationism, the idea, well, if I get this life wrong with God, at least I'll stop existing one day. It's not true. You will not stop existing. Your heart will stop beating on this earth, and then you will wake up face to face with your maker, and you will have to answer to him. And what you do with Jesus Christ in this life makes the difference in eternity, whether you will enjoy his glorious presence or be eternally ruined and devastated by its judgment. So in, in a very real sense, we are forever beings. Angelic beings are forever beings. But angels and humans had a starting point. And our eternal existence is still derivative. That is, it is derived from God. We do not self-exist. Only God self-exists. And he does so forever. They praise him. They praise him for his judgment, his sovereignty, his eternality, his power, his holiness. This is substantive worship. And they give him glory. Now, in what sense can created beings give God glory? Have you ever wondered that? There is a difference in your Bible between ascribed glory and intrinsic glory. Intrinsic glory is that which belongs to God. He is just intrinsically glorious. It belongs all to himself and it comes out of him. It radiates out in brilliance. 
I like Jonathan Edwards' description of his intrinsic glory. It is the sum total of God's attributes radiating out in dazzling beauty. Ascribed glory is when creatures appropriately recognize God's intrinsic glory. Right? It's the difference in an athlete between the athlete being in the weight room, putting in the work, uh, doing all the behind the scenes stuff, and then on the field of play does some amazing thing. That's intrinsic And when everybody claps, that's ascribed. Ascribed glory is what these four living beings render to God. He is worthy of all the fame and applause and recognition of who he all in himself actually is. And they give him honor. Sincere, reverent rendering of what is due. They know their place and they know his place. And they give him thanks, a gratitude that reflects a true knowledge of the character of the one they worship. Look at verse 10. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and they will cast their crowns before the throne. And and this picks up on the when in verse 9. When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks, then the 24 elders respond. This is responsive singing, antiphonal, responsive worship. One party, then another. The four living beings leading the 24 elders following suit. And notice the expression of worship of the 24. What do they do? They fall down and they worship. They will remove those golden victory wreaths from their heads and they will throw them on the crystal pavement before the throne of God. What an excellent use of a reward. If, if the golden wreath, the, the Stephanos crown, is a reward given for faithful servant on the earth for humans, what an appropriate employment of that gift from God to give it back to God, to lay it before him in reverent thanks, to proclaim visibly from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever, amen. It is a recognition that all they have is given and it appropriately rebounds right back to him in worship. And look at verse 11. Now the 24 join in song. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they created. They, were, they existed and were created. God is worthy to receive the glory, honor, and power. You know when somebody receives honor who does not deserve it? It's a scandal. The guy who took steroids to set home run records or win bicycle races, or in the last few years, men pretending to be women and winning athletic contests, when someone receives praise and accolades and honors and awards and scholarships and trophies undeserved, it is a dishonor. It's a shame. It's a scandal and everyone knows it. But God is worthy. This notion gets at the very center of all theology, at the very godness of God. There is no one like him. He is worth all of this attention. He is worthy to receive all the glory and praise and honor and power. It is not selfish for God to receive this fame, to assemble around himself concentric circles of worshipers. It is not the vanity of an egomaniac for God to make himself the center of attention. It is actually the kindness of God in his infinite greatness and glory to allow finite creatures to enjoy his infinite excellence. It is generous. He is the one worthy of all praise and he wants to share his infinitely praiseworthy presence with undeserving creatures. And that you and I could read about this and talk about it as if we're going to be there and enjoy it. Because believer in Jesus Christ, you will. It's just too good to be true. No one in heaven thinks it's unfair that God gets all the attention. Enemies may despise it, but even Satan will be compelled to acknowledge that it is right. And no sinner whom God redeems will ever regret giving all glory to God. 
He is justly, appropriately, delightfully the center of attention and the only one worthy of this praise. And notice the justification in verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Here in chapter 4, by right of creation. For you created all things. Because of your will they existed and were created. End of song. We'll get to another justification in chapter 5. The blood of the Savior will be another cause for singing these same things. But here, all by itself, the justification for this kind of praise is simply the right of God as creator of all things to receive it. Because everything was created by God. Everything got its beginning because God. This is fiat creation. By your will they existed. By by your will they have gone on existing. And by your will they came into existence. That's the force of the words here. We exist, therefore we must worship. That's the bottom line. This is the preoccupation of heaven. It is the real future history of the earth when the kingdom of heaven arrives here. And I think there are implications for our worship here and now before the kingdom comes. I don't know about you, but between last Sunday and this Sunday, I've been distracted. I've sinned. I have maligned God, I have dishonored Him. I have not rendered to Him the glory that He is due. I should have listened to my own sermon last week and just been in such awe of God that I should never sin again. That's the ought. That is right. That would be appropriate. And we're not there yet. We run a race. We want to persevere. We want to keep our faith and our eyes of faith on Christ. We want to seek to not get tangled up by sin. The Christian life is hard. There's a day coming when there will be no distractions. While we live here by faith, struggling, persevering, clinging to faith. How important is it for us to get together? To be together on Sundays? To join our voices with the lyrics from Revelation 4 and 5? To join our hearts around what heaven sings? To anticipate what's coming? To get a a foretaste of glory? It's important for us to hear from him and be recalibrated. And you know when you miss being together, you you miss small group, you, you miss a Sunday morning, you miss a phone call or a card or an email from fellow believers, and you just straggle and struggle in a world bent on ignoring God and rebelling against him. It's hard. Listen, the universal obligation of the created and the unique privilege of the redeemed is to worship God. And this preview from heaven, I think, tells us some things we ought to think about in our worship of him. Individually, when you worship God, in secret, when no one sees. When we gather together collectively, as a church to worship God. And then in the Romans 12 definition of worship, your whole life lived in sacrificial service. You're you're dragging the carcass of your life as a sacrifice up onto the altar of service to God. You're, You're living out worship. How should we think about it? Our worship ought to pick up some cues here from the concentric circles in the throne room. It ought to be sincere. God sees through hypocritical worship. He he sees through someone going through the motions, playing church, sing songs but not mean it. He, He knows all that. Our worship ought to be substantive. 
Our worship of God is not emotionalism. Oh, it is emotional. But it's not emotionalism. Like, I'm excited about the hype. Everybody in the same place doing the same thing. It's kind of cool. It makes a good feeling. That's not worship. And genuine, real, biblical worship is going to be grounded on the truths of who God is. It means you actually have to know theology. Theology is not boring. If this chapter is boring, you're in a lot of trouble. Our worship must also be anticipatory. That means we're looking forward to something. When you come in here and sing on a Sunday morning, I I want you to know how I pray for you Sunday mornings. I pray that everyone who comes through these doors and sings these songs will mean every word they sing. Listen, we sing beyond our living. I preached, I preach beyond my ability to obey. (laughs) There's an aspiration and an anticipation in what we do. We sing, I love you, Lord, and it's like, I want to. We sing about faith and we say, Lord, help my unbelief. We sing about the glories of God and we have very little idea what we're talking about, but we want to. And so our worship together anticipates the fullness of what it will be. Our worship ought to be reverent, not casual, not flippant, not arrogant. We ought to be awestruck awestruck at the mighty, magnificent majesty of God and awestruck at his grace that he would allow his name on our lips. Our worship ought to be holy, not harboring sin, two-timing with God, syncretistically wanting a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of the world. We've got to confess sin when we see it. And our worship has to be theocentric, God-centered. God's at the center of the throne in heaven. How should we think about worship? Listen, there's a reason our musicians, who are not the worship team, you recognize that, right? Every believer gathered together is the worship team. God's the audience. The musicians are like the the start button, (laughs) to to get all of us getting our thoughts and our hearts and our words together toward God. But those musicians, they they don't showcase and showboat. They they want you to forget that they exist. Listen, I want you to forget that I exist when I play a wrong note. But they don't want to be seen or heard at all. They, They want you to worship God. And listen, heaven endorses the art form of music and instrumentation, and vocalizing, and resonance, and beauty, all of that. And and we try to pre-mimic those things here. But it has to be about God. And listen, that's the obligation of of those who lead us toward God in worship, to lead us toward God. It is also the obligation of all of us who gather together together to think about God, to mean the words that we sing, to pray for a heart that resonates with the things we're saying with our lips. And it means our worship is not anthropocentric, not man-centered, and frankly, not (laughs) me-centered. Heaven is just not about me, and praise God for that. It's not about you. It will always be about the radiating glory of the infinite God, giving himself for the enjoyment of his creatures. Let's pray. God, you are peerless in majesty, unrivaled in power, in greatness, in grandeur, in brilliance. You dwell in unapproachable light, and yet you qualify your saints to stand in your presence blameless, with great joy. There's no one like you. And that you would qualify us who believe in your son to be there, to experience what you've described. This is so clearly not about anything we could do, but only of your grace. Oh, how we long for the day when heaven will come to earth. And if you would take us home before you come here, 
we would say absent from the body, present with the Lord, better by far. Come Lord Jesus.